have heard that it said to them of old, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. And so you shall be children of your father in heaven. And such stuff like that. And he let it rip. We, we tend to think of Jesus as all lovey-dovey, cuddling, cuddling little lambs and children. And I'm sure that's an aspect of his being. But he, he could really let you have it. It's quite amusing. Woe to you Pharisees. You clean the outside of the grave and you're full of dead man's bones. I mean, imagine saying that to someone. <laughs> you know what you remind me of? You remind me of a coffin. <laughs> That's what he said. Like John the Baptist. You brooding vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath of God. Man. <laughs> I haven't heard anyone call people a brood of vipers for a while. Not that we should. But you just say that. Those are the people that got the response from the audience because today we're so afraid of offending people. You see, offense can be a new word for the conviction of sin. Without the conviction of sin, there's no repentance. Without repentance, there's no conversion. We don't want to clean people up on the outside. The Pharisees were good at that. The gospel of prosperity, again, I believe in, in, it's like a picture in the, in, the, in the jigsaw puzzle. I believe in some aspects of this message. I will tell you very clearly I do. I believe in health, I believe in, in holiness, and I believe in happiness. Because the Bible says that we are to preserve spirit, soul, and body blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that. But, but to, to get all out to where that's your only message is dangerous. It's part of the big picture. When it comes up in the scripture, you deal with it and you move on. Then you go on to repenting or whatever it is the Lord wants to talk about. So it's all about health and wealth and happiness, financial blessing. I know one person, she had, she had a picture of, of a plane on her computer screen and I said, why do you have that there? And she said, that's what I'm believing God's gonna give me. And the members in another church all had a picture of the car that they wanted, their next car. Okay, it's good to believe in those things and have faith in those things, but maybe have something on your screen like whatever you do, in word or deed towards the glory of God, or seek first the kingdom of God, or something like that. You know, don't focus on the material object. Don't focus on the benefit of being a Christian. Focus on Christ, and Christ will take care of the benefit. Amen. So we won't go into that too much. John Piper said this: "What does it? What does not prosper a man's business, so that he can move? Oh, God does not prosper a man's business, so he can move from Ford to Cadillac." God prospers his business so that 17,000 unreached people can be reached with the gospel. You see, it depends on the priority. Why do you want the money? What's the motivation for the money? I'd like, as I said before, to have enough money that I could buy a plot of land and we could build our own sanctuary. Wouldn't that be awesome? Amen. Build it up, you know, make room, but build the first part a thousand seater and leave some room for extension. Amen. Have a park car park and a swimming pool for baptisms and a Woo. guest house for visiting evangelisms, you know? Yeah. And a children's Sunday school building and all that stuff. I like to be that prosperous. Would I have some benefit from that? Maybe so. But remember that it all depends on your motivation. We talked about Latorno and, and Rockefeller and some of these uh, Colgate amazing men of God that, that um, did so much for the kingdom of God because God blessed them financially. The social gospel is the application of the Christian ethics to a social problem. And this is, this is a very dangerous, we're, we're actually now in a very dangerous position because we're doing so much humanitarian outreach that many organizations start like us, and I won't name them because we're not better than them. And God uses them and, and people get touched, but they receive government funding and that makes them shut down the message of the gospel. That's one, that's, that's the first. That's the real dangerous key. When you get to that point, we say, I can get government funded, but I can't evangelize. That's the war. That's the amber light. Don't cross that line. There's so many organizations that are in that category today. And so it, it's a social a gospel that alleviates poverty, crime, alcohol, health problems, teaches with this gospel, advocate Jesus will come back when there's no more social ills. However, even Jesus said, we are the salt and light of the earth. If we're not bringing people to reconcile to God through Christ, it doesn't matter what good works we do. The trend of Christianity today is many churches in the world have failed to understand the Great Commission and they're paying lip service to the Great Commission and leading to the tragic normalcy, which is the Great Omission. 
tell you something. The church I was with before had a fraternity, and in that fraternity was a church that had a mission. They'd been running for 10 years. They had a community center, people coming to cook, and all these good things. And you know what the pastor said? 10 years no one's come to Christ. I think I've wasted my time. That's 10 years fundraising and giving and people coming in. And you see, what we do is beautiful. We, we, we focus on evangelism. And Jesus said this. Just remember, Jesus said this. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me ask you something. How can a worldly person glorify your Father which is in heaven? Hmm. By becoming a Christian. If the good works don't lead to conversion, you're wasting your time and money. You're feeding and clothing and housing and washing people up, getting them one day closer to a Christless grave. Remember that. Tomorrow as you go out, just think, what if I were to die tonight? God forbid, because Chris said that Jesus isn't coming back tomorrow. But what if I were personally to have my own personal second coming? If Jesus would come to me for me, would I be pleased with the look on his face when we encounter one another? Yeah. That's the way to look at tomorrow. That's the way to look at what we do tomorrow. You know, so, so like be prepared for the worst and expect the best we say it like that so just think before the sun goes down tomorrow what do i want to do that i can assure my heart that jesus will be pleased with me mm. that if i were to meet him tonight god forbid he would say to me well done thou good and faithful servant enter thou into the joy of the lord that's the way we should live let's take a break now and then we'll go into uh the